Good morning, everybody. Man, we're so glad you guys are here. Uh, my name is Clint. I'm uh, the student director here. This is my friend Ivy. And uh, so we are celebrating uh, Passion Camp today. And so we'll get to that in a second. So you will be able to see a little bit of the video. But we want to first say, if you are here for the first time or you're, you're uh, here, man, we are so glad you're here with us. We want to welcome you. Um, to Good News Church. If you, if you have, want to connect with us anyway, on the back of your seat is a connection card, connect card. You can fill out that. Just leave it um, in one of the baskets or give it to one of us and uh, we'll make sure to connect. Is this thing echoing? Am I echoing? Is it just me? All right, good. All right, all right good. Connect. It bothers me with the echo. I'm like, echo! And, uh, and so we're just so glad you're here. And so we just got back from camp a couple weeks ago, not this past week, but this week. And so uh, you can see our leaders, if you see the old people in there with the pe faces painted and all that, wearing, wearing uh, bear costumes, our leaders get really into this. So, but we're it's Chaos Bear! Oh. Woo! Every this is, uh, so if you, when you go to camp, there's a, there's a bear that's called Chaos Bear, and, uh, and then he just causes chaos the whole time. And so uh, Good News decided we're going to bring our own chaos bear and so because of uh, the efforts of our leaders and our students and chaos bear we don't want to brag or anything but we brought home we do want to brag the championship we were that maverick all right maverick so we were maverick and so tell us a little bit throughout the week we had squad wars which was amazing games and competitions and the leaders and students that went last year came back and said Next year we're going to go and we're going to win it. And we totally did. It was amazing. Yeah. So that week, during the week, the most incredible thing was seeing, of course, our students grow closer to Jesus, but also to their small groups. A lot of great connections were made. Um, we took about three times as many people from the WGB campus as we did last year. And next year we want to take even more. So start planning. Students start swirling your money away. We're going to go to Passion with a bigger group next year. Yeah, it was incredible to see so many uh, kids really just kind of grow in their relationship. We had, certainly had a few people that made decisions uh, to follow Christ with their life. And uh, so we were just so grateful to spend the time uh, together. But to spend the time together as students and, and leaders and have our small group leaders with our students was incredible. So it was an awesome, awesome week. And so we are um, just thankful to you guys. We did, we helped some students go. And so because of your generous giving um, over the year, it, it helped us help some students go as well. And so thank you, thank you. You all participated in an incredible week with our students. So thank you for that. So, um, so. Just a, a few quick announcements. Uh, uh, so if you're here again, just make sure you fill that connection card. We have something coming up Ivy's going to tell you about. So our Back to School Bash is going to be on Sunday, August 13th. If you remember last year, this was the event. We had the gigantic water slides going in three sections of the yard. Um, we have, we'll have pizza. So um, make sure you invite your neighbors. This is a great time to bring um, people from the community in and let them see what our church is all about and have a lot of fun, get the school year kicked off. Um, so students, what I need from you guys is to maybe sign up with Miss Tanya in the lobby to volunteer um, to maybe kind of spot the, the little kids on the slides starting right after church and going until about one. And then from one to four, it flips over to just students. So we'll have all of our student ministry kids and all the people they want to invite for a big kid time for one to four. Yeah, we have a few other things coming up as well. So um, July 26th, which is this coming Wednesday, is our student ministry beach, at the beach student ministry day at the beach. And so we're going to meet here at 9. And so if you have a student that wants to go to the beach, we actually have a school bus, one of the uh, St. John's County school buses that's going to meet us here. We're going to jump on together, go to Anastasia State Park, hang out for a few hours, and then, uh, and then come back. And uh, on the way back, we're going to hit a quick uh, sweet treat place on the way. Uh, we're going to provide food and all that stuff as well. And so if you're interested, just check, uh, just make sure you're here at 9 o'clock on Wednesday. And, uh, and then also, our, um, we're back um, on August 16th. I had to make sure it wasn't the 11th. August 16th is our first week back. We take the summer off for meeting regularly on Wednesday nights. We had several events that we've done. But August 16th, we're back. And so it's our first night back as a student ministry meeting here every single Wednesday night starting around 6 p.m. And the 11th, that event's going to be a worship night here at the church as we pray for schools and the school year starting off and have some beautiful worship and there will be child care for that. So join us then too. Awesome. We carry that for me. It's not, I don't want that as a sweat rag or anything. All right. Well, good morning. So glad you're here. Chaos. Let's give it up for Chaos Bear. Give it up for Ivy. Let's give it up for our uh, students over here that went to Passion. So glad to see you guys. All right. So, uh, 
man, so let's pray real quick as we get into the Word. And uh, man, pray for me because I'm not sure what I'm saying up here right now. So, uh, so uh, it's, it, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. So let's pray. God, we need your Word this morning. God, we need your presence. God, we invite you into this place. God, move in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in 2008, there was a, a Hurricane Ike, and if you're old enough, may, you know, you probably heard of it. Some of you guys may not know, but there was a hurricane, 2000, uh, hurricane in 2008, Hurricane Ike, that moved into Texas, and, uh, and with about 110 mile an hour winds, it hit the Galveston area, and it hit this little town, this little island called Gilchrist, and of all of the 200 houses that were um, on that island, they were all gone, 199 were gone, one was left standing. And so it's an incredible picture. And if I, can, if I had time, I'd tell you more about the family. They lost their house in 2005 um, to another hurricane. And they were like, look, if we're going to rebuild. We're going to hire a master builder. We're going to fortify this thing. We're going to build on solid ground. We are going to build in such a way that we can withstand the storms. And so they built in such a way that when the storm came, it, it, it lasted. But everything else is gone. And so I think that picture, that picture is incredible, that picture is, it's, it really is, it's a sad reminder of how many of our, many of, uh, of people's lives in their Christian faith. And many people who go to camp, young people, because I, I, we've gone to camp and people make this choice, they make this decision, and they say, I want to give my life to Christ. But when the storms came, when the storms come, and there's um, the storms of, of whether it's just getting back to normal life, or the pressures of life, or the temptations of life, there's very few ever left standing. And today we want to encourage you and encourage our students to, to, be, to be the one, to be the one that's faithful, to be the one that's left standing, to be the one that is, that is a, a city on a hill that no matter when the storms come, no matter how they come, no matter what your storms look like, that you are the city on the hill, you're the one left standing, you're the one that can say, I will build my house on the rock of Jesus. And so today we're going to talk about remaining faithful. And we're continuing um, kind of through 2 Timothy it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote um, to, to his spiritual son Timothy from a Roman prison. And to, and to set some, create some backstory, um, Paul was in a Roman prison twice during his time in Rome. And the first time, he was there for a couple years, and it was a, it was like a, it was a, um, a, 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 a house prison. What do you call that? House arrest. Thank you. Hang on. I'm like, he, was, he was in a house. So it was like house arrest. And uh, while he was awaiting trial, they had him in a house arrest, his accusers never came, so his case got dropped, he got released, and then he went back to work. He went back to preaching the gospel, planting churches, and so, but in 64 AD, something earth-shattering happened, is uh, Rome burnt to the ground. It was considered, uh, or assumed that about one-fourth to one-third of Rome was in complete ash, and, and the emperor at the time, Nero, did nothing to stop it, and so they started blaming Nero, and so to save face, Nero was like, it's the Christians, right? So he started blaming the Christians, and so he started rounding up and arresting and killing Christians, and, and persecution became a, a deal. I mean, it was already, but that became a deal. Like, you don't, you don't, you associate as a Christian, man, we're, they're after you, and so they got Paul, and they brought, they arrested Paul, and Paul was the, was the, was, was the, was the leader in the church, so he represented a crown jewel and Christianity. He was the leadership. He represented the leadership of the church. But this, so when they brought Paul the second time, it wasn't house arrest. It was a very different setting. They put him in a dungeon. They put him somewhere where, they, and they don't, they don't give you anything. Look, you're, you're, you're going to die here, right? And so they don't give you anything. They don't feed you. They don't bring you anything. When you're on house arrest, you can have people come freely and, you know, pretty freely and bring you stuff. But that didn't really happen in this place. But we're going to read about a story as, as, as Paul wrote to Timothy, but Paul knew that his time, this was his last stop. This is where he dies. He, he finished up 2 Timothy saying this, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time is for my departure has come. I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, and I kept the faith. And that's 2 Timothy 4, but we're going to be looking at a scripture in 2 Timothy 1 where he's writing to Timothy about someone, only one, that was faithful. And so we're going to start in 11. Brad spoke a few weeks ago and covered some of these scriptures, and, and Dylan spoke last week and covered some of these scriptures. But we're going to start in 11 and just kind of work up to where we are, picking up in 15. And this is Paul writing to Timothy, and he says, God chose me to be a preacher, an apostle, a teacher of the good news. That is why I'm suffering here in prison. But I'm not ashamed for it, for I know the one whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I've entrusted to him until the day of his return. 
And then he encourages Timothy, hold on to the pattern of the wholesome teaching that you've learned from me. A pattern shaped by faith and love and that you have in Christ Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that's been entrusted to you. Carefully guard the gospel. Carefully guard the good news that has been entrusted to you. And then this is where we pick up. He says in 15, and as you know, everyone for the providence of Asia has deserted me. He's in this dungeon. He's like, look, everybody's deserted me. Even, even Phygelus and Hermogenes, which by the way, I wanted to name my son one of those. My wife said, no, can you believe it? So, but I mean, if you say, look, everybody did this, even, then you, and you name a name, man, that person wasn't someone you expected to do what they did. Everyone but and even. And so he says, Every, everybody deserted me. Dude, are you kidding me, Timothy? Even Phygelus and Hermogenes, right? But then he says, but may the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. I got to say that a bunch of times today, so I got to get it right. Onesiphorus, all right? Onesiphorus and his family, because he often visited me and encouraged me. He, never, he was never ashamed of me when I was in chains. You know, when he... Onesiphorus was part of the church in Ephesus. He wasn't from Rome. And so when everybody else deserted him, Onesiphorus came to Rome. And he wasn't ashamed of where Paul was. A lot of people thought, well, man, what, what's wrong with this Paul dude? He keeps getting arrested. So even Christians were like, eh, man. I'm, and then so what's wrong with Paul? And then the ones that still were comfortable with who Paul was were like, uh, I'm not going to Rome. I'm not going to that prison. This uh, Onesiphorus has to show up and ask, hey, has anybody seen Paul? He's hidden in a dungeon. He's not from Rome. He has to find Paul. Imagine the effort that he has to go through walking around, asking, I'm looking for Paul. You know, the Christian, he's my buddy. I'm bringing him, I'm bringing him stuff. When everybody else was fearful of persecution, Onesiphorus showed up. He came to Paul. He came from a far, far away. And he, and, and he was not ashamed of his chains. And when he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. And may the Lord show his special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. And so he's pointing back to look, not only did he come to Rome and search for me and be here for me. Man, you remember what he was like in Ephesus as well. You remember how, how helpful and how, uh, how, um, how joyful and how faithful he was when we were in Ephesus as well. And so, so we're going to talk a little bit about Onesiphorus. But we don't really know. This is, this, is the only per, this is the only time he's mentioned in the Bible. Paul mentions him twice in this letter to Timothy, but really in the same context. He just kind of refers back to what he said the first time. So the only thing we've ever heard about Onesiphorus. said that one right. All right. So what do we know about Onesiphorus? One, he was a loyal friend to Paul since he went out of his way to search for him during his imprisonment in Rome. When everyone else abandoned him, Onesiphorus went to him. So we know he's... We know he was faithful friends. Second, we know that he was clearly a man of faith, as evidenced by his willingness to serve Paul in his proclamation of the gospel. Come on, you don't just show up to that unless you are confident in who Jesus is. If you're not showing up and asking everybody, hey, I'm here for Paul. I'm here to bring him some food. You guys aren't feeding him. I'm here to feed him. And I'm showing up to take care of my friend and, and the person that showed me Jesus. You are clearly a person of deep faith if you're going to show up in that situation and support Paul's proclamation of the gospel, faith. The third thing is this. Onesiphorus was apparently a generous man, and he provided financial assistance to Paul during this time of need. It's what we know. I mean, he's mentioned one time in the Bible. There might be one or two other things you could pull out of it, but that's, that's what we know of Onesiphorus. But we also know by, by the way that he lived out his faith, we, we know that he was a picture of Jesus. That we can see his faith, we can see his faithfulness and say, that's Jesus. And he only got it from Jesus. The first thing that he was pictured of Jesus, he searched for Paul as Jesus searches for us. Luke says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The second thing, that he was a picture of Jesus, he was not ashamed of Paul's chains. Like Jesus is not ashamed of us. Hebrews 12.1 says, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Jesus isn't ashamed of us, even in our sin. The third thing is he refreshed Paul, Onesiphorus. Refresh Paul as Jesus refreshes us. John 7 talks about 
rivers of living water, that Jesus is just a refreshment. And the fourth thing is that he's been with Paul. He's been there in Ephesus. He's been there now. And as Jesus is always and will always be there with us. And he says, as, and be assured of this in Matthew, I'm all, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so my question, I'm going to put this on, I put this up there, is, man, what enabled Onesiphorus to act like this? Everybody else. I, mean, I don't know how many Christians that Paul and, and, and the, and that had, had raised up or had, had shared the gospel with the leadership and, and Hermogenes and, and Phygelus and how many other ones there were. I don't know how many there were. There was one. One showed up. One persevered. One was still standing, even in the face of, if I show up here, I might get, I'm probably going to get arrested. I'm probably going to die. One showed up. So I, what enables an Onesiphorus to, to act like this? What makes someone that countercultural? We can only conclude that he was overwhelmed by his love for Jesus and that he was now free from the approval of people, from the, free from the fear of scorn, free from the attraction to the things of the world, and free from indifference. And he was, by the power of the gospel, he was free to love. And so my prayer for us this morning, could we be the one, right? Could we be the one? Could we be the one that's, if everybody else abandoned, it, I'm still here, God. If everybody else is unfaithful, I'm still faithful, God. I'm still going to be here. And so the point today is this, is that, we, we, we are completely dependent on Jesus for faithfulness. Faithfulness isn't something I'm like, come on, man, muster it up. Grow it inside of you. Decide to be faithful. You, it, it, we don't have the capability of being faithful. And so the point is that Jesus, and only Jesus, and by asking Jesus to, be, to help us be faithful, Jesus enables us to be faithful and not fickle. And so what does it mean to be faithful? Faithful means firm adherence, ad adherence to the truth and to your duties, unwavering loyalty that isn't easily swayed. Faithful to God means that we're going to continue to trust Him, that he will, he will care for us, that we will follow where He leads and love Him in return, and we will continue to trust in God and follow His commandments even when life is difficult. Faithful. But too sadly, so many of us and, and, and believers are become fickle, and fickle is just changing frequently, especially to one's loyalties, interests, and affections. Fickleness is marked by a lack of steadfast, constant, con, 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 it's not consistency, constancy, is that the word? All right, constancy, all right, thank you. Come on, jump in faster, please, all right? <laughs> Don't let me leave hanging up here. Cook up, cook up, cook. Somebody, all right, thank you. Constancy or stability. Come on, don't be, but, but that, that, that picture just represents so many things. And I can say this, it represents, I'm 49, I'm, I'm 49. I've been around students for a long time, but I've been an adult for a long time. I'm talking a long time, all right? So, man, there's too many of us, including myself, that just find ourselves being fickle and not faithful. And so, the question is, how do we become faithful? And the answer is clearly, you follow the one that is. There's only one faithful. And we have to follow the one that is, with Jesus. You become like the person you hang around. If you hang around Jesus enough, you're going you're gonna to become like Jesus, like Onesiphorus was. Man, there's no question that dude hung around Jesus all the time. I'm not talking in person. I'm just talking about the Holy Spirit in, in, in the word prayer. I mean, you know that guy had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To, for everybody else to abandon, but he's like, I'm showing up. You, gotta be, you hang around people, you become like them. Hang around Jesus, and you become like them. Onesiphorus, no question, did, but, it, but he also hung around Paul, and there's no doubt that Paul is probably the one that taught him how to do it. And so we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit because that's all we know about Onesiphorus. And we still got like 10, 15, 20 minutes to fill, right? So, but Paul is the one that taught him. There's no doubt that he learned from Paul. And so we're going to talk about, man, what is it about Paul? Because he's the one that probably showed him the way to live. And he has here that we know because Paul said over and over and over and over in, the, in, in his letters to his churches to imitate me, watch me, follow me, watch how I live. In Hebrews he says, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. To his letter in Corinthians he said, therefore I urge you, imitate me. To his letters um, to the church of Philippi he said, keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me, everything you've heard from me and saw me doing. Second Thessalonians says, for you... Yourself know that you ought to imitate me. 
In all of his letters, he's writing, like, look, hey, watch me live. Watch me give my life to Christ. I wonder of how many of us could say, hey, guys, watch me. Watch how I live. Imitate me. Imitate me, and, I, and, and you'll be moving forward to Christ. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I can. Don't. <laughs> all right? So we're going to talk about Paul, not me. All right? But I wonder how many of us can do that. And, man, shouldn't that be our goal? I mean, shouldn't it be a goal of us to be like, man, I want to be able to have a, not stand on stage and do it, but have a relationship with somebody who's like, watch me live. You want to know about Jesus? Watch me. And I, I, I would venture to say there's very few of us that have ever had that conversation. Because they're like, yeah, maybe just watch me sometimes. <laughs> Don't watch me. Don't, maybe when I'm in public. Not when I'm talking to my wife. All right. Oh, that, that slipped out. All right. So, all right. Okay. So, so what about Paul? What about Paul a lot, would, 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 would be able to help him do that? And so we're going to kind of change. Oh, my gosh. I forgot my whole thing in my car. Who wants to go to my car? No, man. All right. All right. I forgot. I had, I had a whole little thing that I was going to do, and I forgot it in my car. That's all right. We don't need it. All right. Okay. So it was, it was so good, too. All right. Uh, all right. So. We're still going to do it. You're just going to have to use your imagination, all right? Unless somebody's got, I can use something. All right, here we go. All right, so in James, so that James 4 says this, you really don't know about tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for only a short time, a short while before it vanishes. Now, you've probably heard that before, and James is just really communicating a, 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 a difficult point, right? Is that we're, we're just here for a short time. There's thousands of years before we came. Thousands of years are going to be after us, right? We, we're, our life is a mist. And so looking at 2 Corinthians, you can, we're just going to add so. So if we're here for such a short time, so we fix our eyes not as what, not on what is seen, but what is unseen since, we've seen since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Man, I'm only here. It's a mist. It's a vapor. As soon as the sun comes out, it vapors away, whatever that word is, right? And so... So I fix my eyes on what's unseen. I fix my eyes on eternal. And I wonder if how many of us really ever think about eternity. Do I wake up today and say, am I, am I living my life for what's unseen? Am I, am I living my life for eternity? And we sat down and thought about that idea because here's what Paul says in Philippians 1. Paul says this, for to me, 121, or 121 to 25, for to me living means living for Christ, but dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. And so Paul lives in this mentality of like, look, if I live today, great. If I die, even better. To live is for Christ. To die is with Christ. And man, better is with, not for. I love for, but for's got some struggles. I'm in a prison. I'm in a, for's got some struggles. With is unbelievable. And so Paul has this mentality of, I live my life with, with, this, with this mentality of, 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 of eternity. He says, I'm torn between these two desires. I long to go and to be with Christ, which would be far better for me. Now, he's not in any hurry to die. He's not saying, oh, you know, whatever. But he's saying, look, if it comes, if God calls my number, great, because it's with Christ. But I'm torn, and I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me, but for your sake, his church's sake, it's better that I continue to live. Convinced of this, I know that I'll remain and I'll continue with all, all of you for your progress and joy in the Lord. So mad. All right. Okay. This is so stupid. All right. Okay. So imagine I have a rope in my hand, which I had. All right. Okay. It's okay. We can do it. We can do it. And the rope, this part represents your life. Okay. Everybody see that? It's a rope, all right? And there's a continuum, and it just keeps going along, all the way around the world a few times, all the way. That represents eternity, okay? That's all I was going to do, but it, it's better with a rope. So, so you're like, you think you made way too big with Dilla. I'm really disappointed right now. If I could cry on stage, I would. All right, so, but, so this part represents your life, and then all of eternity, this rope keeps going, wraps around the world a few times. That's, that's eternity. Paul is saying, I, I live my life for this. Like this, this part right here where, where, where life ends and eternity begins. Come on, Dylan. There you go. 
All right. All right. Now I need a pen. All right. So I still got to do this. All right. Eternity. All right. So this part right here, my rope was so great, I tape, put tape on. And, oh, my gosh. All right. This part right here where life ends and eternity begins, that's, how, that's what I live my life for. Every day I wake up with that in mind. Every day I wake up and I think, if, if today's the day, I'm living my life for eternity. And so we're going to walk through Philippians to see how, he can, how we can imitate Paul. Because Philippians 3 is the, one of the best scripts is just to walk through and be like, Paul explaining what it is to put your faith in Jesus. To have your hope in Jesus. Not to have your hope. It's insane if you're a Christian. If you call yourself a believer, then you have to believe that how we live this life... What I do in this life, how I put, invest my time, my treasure, and my talent, it, it, it determines how, how I live my eternity. That everything in this moment right here, where life ends and eternity begins, becomes two things. Regret or reward. Everything I do in my life only adds up to two things and in this moment. It's regret I regret I even did all that or put my time into that. Watch that whole stupid Netflix special. Regret or reward. And Paul's like, reward. I'm going to wake up every day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to live for the reward. I'm going to live for this moment. To die is to gain. This is, what my, this is what I'm looking to. Right? And so Philippians, he, we're going to start kind of back. Philippians 3 says this. This is Paul talking about all of his qualifications, his heritage, his family, his positioning, his knowledge. Come on, if you don't know, Paul was like the Hebrew of Hebrews, right? He was, he was, like, he was, he was, he was a Pharisee, which, and, and, and sometimes we think of Pharisees as a negative term, but they were super respected. He was super knowledgeable. And so he, he starts at Philippians 3, and he says, We rely on what Christ has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though if I could have confidence in my effort... Although I could have confidence in my effort if anyone ever could. This is tall, Paul talking trash. He's like, look, we're completely dependent on Jesus. We can't rely on any human effort. <laughs> but if we could, by the way, I'm better than all of you. Right? <laughs> and just so nobody, I'm not, I'm not, I'm Paul. None of you should think anything highly of yourself. Because trust me, I'm about to go through the list. If there was somebody that had favor from God, it would be me. Not you. But we can't to put our confidence in these things. And he says, if I, uh, though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, in others, if others have reasons for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight years old. I don't know why he bragged about that. All right? I'm just kidding. So it means he was born in the right family. All right? I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I'm a member of the Pharisees who demands the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so jealous, or zealous, not jealous, zealous that I harshly persecuted the church as for, and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. He lists these seven things that just basically says, if anybody could earn their way to God, could earn favor from God, it's me, bro. It's not you, but I'm going to tell you, as I started, we rely completely on what Christ has done for us. And so in Philippians 3, 7, he says, I once thought these things. So he's talking. Oh, let me back up. So he's basically sharing. Okay, he's basically sharing what we share every week. Bad news, good news. Hey, the bad news? The bad news is you can't earn it. If somebody could, it'd be me. You can't, but then I can't. The bad news is we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And we're in trouble. Because of our sin, we're in trouble. We're separate from God. But the good news the good news is we can rely on what Jesus has done for us. And so we have to ask every, every time. Every time you, you, have you, have you no, accepted Christ for what he's done for you? Have you asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life because what he's done? Because like Paul, even as what he can brag about, none of us can earn God's favor. Only Jesus. And in 7, he says, I once thought all these things were valuable. All those things, all his heritage, his positioning. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ. He says this three times. I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yeah, everything is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ. 
as Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness all those things he was talking about through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. We're completely dependent on Jesus for everything. We're completely dependent on Jesus for a relationship with our Father. We're completely dependent on relationship, I mean, on Jesus to give us, to help us be faithful. Paul would say, hey, of all those things are worthless. None of it counts for anything. Like you, if Paul would say, look, I am the one that lived up. I obeyed the law without fault. Worthless. It means nothing. It counts for nothing. The only thing that matters, the only thing that counts is my relationship with Jesus is to gain Christ, to gain Christ, to know him, to have faith in him. And so this morning, do you know Jesus? Have you gained Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus? And he goes on in in 10 and says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Thank you again, Dylan. And Paul is consumed with, with this, this moment. Life ends and eternity begins. And I want to, 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 to die is the game. I mean, look, if today's the day, great, I get to be with Jesus. And until then, my whole reason for being here is for that moment. My whole reason for being here, if you go back and read what he, what he said earlier, if I can find it, he said, Oh, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and the joy of the faith. Right, so, Man, if today was a day, great. But since today's not, I rejoice in that. Why? For you and for your progress and the joy of your faith. His whole life is wrapped around eternity. Even if I'm here today, it's for eternity. Everything, everything I do in this life is for this moment to where I get to meet Jesus and be with him forever. And so he says, goes on in Philippians 12. It says, not that I've already obtained it, or arrived at my goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've achieved it, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward goal of God, of Jesus, of, of God in Christ Jesus. What's his goal? I mean, he's like, look, man, I, everything I do is for that moment. Everything I do is for, is for Christ. Everything I do is for Jesus. Everything I do is, is with the mentality of, 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 of eternity of that moment where life ends and eternity begins and what that moment looks like for me and Jesus. That's what my whole life is about. But he says, but I, just so you know, like, hey, two things. One is, just, I, not, that I'm, not that I've already arrived at my goal. What's my goal? My goal is to be like Christ. Not that I've already arrived to that, but my goal is to be with Christ. Not that I've gotten there yet. He has two goals. Goal is to be like Christ, which I'll never really be like Christ until I'm with Christ, so to die is to gain. I want to be like Christ, but I know, as Paul said, look, things that I, that I wish I didn't, th- that I know I shouldn't do, I do. Things that I know I should do, I don't do. So Paul still had human in him. I want to be like Christ. That's my goal. That's my desire is to know him. But my goal is, is kind of a double-sided coin. I want to be like him, but I know I can't be like him until I'm with him. And then once I'm with him, man, it's, it's going to be amazing. So how many of us, that's our goal? Like how many wait? Like we that we live. What would Paul say? Imitate me. Watch me live. That's what we're supposed to be watching. Paul would tell us like, over and over in his letters to his churches. Watch me live. Imitate me. Do what I do. What are you doing, Paul? I'm doing everything I can to be like him, and I'm looking forward to the day that I'm with him. Watch what I do. Imitate that. Paul refers to our journey with Jesus. As a race, at least five times in his letters that I know of. Let me give you a few. He says, Hebrews 12, 1. Let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perfect perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. First Corinthians says, don't you realize that a race, everyone runs, but, one, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. Galatians says, we're running the race. You, oh, you were running the race so well. What? Who? has held you back from following the truth. So, I love Jesus, obviously. Well, I say obviously. Hopefully it's obvious, right? But Jesus' parables were always about farming and fishing. Two things I don't know anything about. 
Paul always talks about sports. And I'm like, yeah, I know a little bit about that. And so Paul over and over is using this imagery of a race, but not just, he's referring to the the races in Greece at the time that, that are like our Olympics, but he's referring to that moment like, I'm not quite there, right? I'm not, I haven't quite gotten to the tape. I'm, I'm striving, I'm straining, I'm leaning, I'm, I'm giving every ounce of energy. It's those last four or five steps. You with me? Like, I was watching, I don't know if you guys remember, it was the last race I watched, so I don't watch racing that much. But it was the Olympics, Summer Olympics, what, four years ago? Three years ago? And that kid, Caleb Dressel, you guys know Caleb Dressel? He was the kid from Clay. He's from Clay High School, or he's from Clay County, or I think he went to both, I don't know. Anyway, so he's swimming, but he's from Clay County. So we got a local boy that's swimming in the Olympics, number one swimmer in the world. And I was like, all right, cool, I'll watch him. You know, I'll see what's up. But I, I mean, if you're a swimmer in here, don't, don't take this wrong. I, don't, I mean, I'm like, whatever. You know, it's not like watching him at the Super Bowl or nothing. And uh, so I'm like sitting there watching. The only, I didn't watch the Olympics, right? I just, but, you know, too much, but I'm watching it. Sitting on the couch, barely paying attention. Just like, he's going, they, they go down. I think they go down and back twice. They go down. Hey, he's, all right, cool, going back. Go down, they get back, and then on the way, they're about halfway down, halfway down that last one. What's up? Uh Uh-oh, what's up? I stand up, come on, let's go, let's go, yes, sir, that's what's up, attaboy, Caleb. And I'm like, and I'm like, I don't even know why I did that. I don't know Caleb, I don't watch swimming, I'm just happy that America, I don't know, I don't know why I did it, but I mean, there's something about that last right that those last few steps where it gets it's that you're leaning you're striving you're and Paul's like man that's that's where I want to live my life right I'm completely dependent on Jesus it's not what I can do it's not that I could do anything I'm completely dependent on what Jesus has done for me but man when that moment comes I'm living every day in those last three or four steps where I'm I'm reaching I'm leaning I'm I'm not I'm getting after it, right? And so Paul, that's the picture he's painting over and over in his letters. He says, follow me or or, or imitate me. It's a race. Run. And so he goes on and he says, but Paul uses uh, this language of forgetting what lies behind and straining straining forward to what lies ahead. And so there just becomes this theme as well in the word that talks about not looking back. Like Paul's like, look, all of these things that, in my life, all of this, the struggle and every, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. We're going to go through a few of them in a second. It doesn't matter. The only thing I got to look to is Jesus. My race is to him. And any, I, w- I was doing a tryout the other day for baseball, and I told these kids, they're like eight. And I'm like, all right, everybody just run forward, right? And this one kid, I don't know, it's, he just like, he ran like sideways. And I was like, what are you doing? He, but he was looking at the people over there. Wherever his eyes went, he went, right? We know that. If your eyes are forward, if your eyes are focused, on, on Jesus, then you, you're running to him, okay? But there's this theme of not looking back. So like, remember the story of Lot's wife. I mean, Paul says, look, I leave everything behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. I don't look back. Uh, remember the story of Lot's wife. God comes to Lot and says, look, get out of the city. I'm about to, I'm about to ruin it. And you get your wife and your kids and you go. Go. Don't look back. Don't look back, Lot. Lot, what I say? You said don't look back. That's right, Lot. Don't look back. And then they start to run and wife's Lot looks back. There's something she's still connected to. She's something she still has an attachment to in the city. And God turns her into a pillar of salt. And then in Luke even, Luke, Jesus says, hey, guys, he's talking to disciples. Hey, guys, remember Lot's wife, right? Remember Lot's wife. What happened to Lot's wife? Well, she turned back and she got, so he says, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. Fellas, stop looking back. Look forward. Look forward to all the things that God's calling you to. I was thinking about this as we were like, who, who, we all love that song, I ran out of that grave, right? So I ran out of that grave. Why would you look back? We talked about that at the, at the last day of passion. Is that, man, you're running. You're running. God's calling you from life, from death to life. You're running to life. Why would you look back to death? Look forward. And then Luke 9 Jesus says, as, as they were walking, through, uh, walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes, oh, I'm sorry, and, oh, yeah, so Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So Jesus said, look, get real comfortable. You want to follow me? Great. Get comfortable at being uncomfortable. Get really comfortable at being uncomfortable. So he said to another man, follow me, but he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own. 
but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another man said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Let them know I won't be home for dinner. And Jesus replied, no one who puts your hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. No one who starts this thing, when God shows you his glory and God opens your eyes and opens your heart, faith is a gift. It's a gift from, from the Lord when he gives you that gift. No one who, 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 who looks upon that and accepts that and decides to look back to all of the other things they still have attachments to in this life is fit for the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is saying. My wife is, uh, did some triathlons and uh, when she was in her 20s, which is a long time ago, all right? And uh, she did some, I'm sorry, so long, guys. I don't even can't even tell you. I'm just saying. Uh, I'm older than her, so I always joke about her being old. All right, so when she was in her 20s, she did a, a triathlon, I gotta, and I got to kind of tell you this quick. So she, uh, she, when she was in high school, she was a sprinter, and she, was a, she went to states in swimming. So, and she, when I met her, she was playing Division I soccer. She's fast. Right? She was fast. She could swim well. She could run well. So she, it's not one of those big ones, right? It's, not, it's one of those kind of her first one where you run, and then you actually swim in a pool like a bunch of laps, and then you get out, but then you, you ride your bike around. And so she runs. She does great. She passes some people. She, she's awesome, all right? And then she swims. I'm like, she's smoking it, dude. She's doing so well. And then she gets on the bike. Now, to me, if, if I was going to do a triathlon, I would only do the bike part because that's, you know. But um, so she gets on the bike. And then, so, but they go, you know, they have to drive around. It's, in, it's down in St. Augustine near Osceola Elementary, but they, they have to drive around. You lose sight of them. Well, people start coming around. I'm like, waiting for, waiting for. I mean, she did so good running, swimming, waiting for. Okay, people, I, I think she passed that guy when she was running. Can I drive by? Um, I, oh, these two girls, I know she passed them. She passed her in the pool. And uh, I'm like, man, I hope she wouldn't get in an accident or something over there. And then finally, I'm like, I see her coming around. Let me say, so my wife is super competitive at times, most times. She's also very experiential. She just wants to experience stuff. Like, I just love the beach. The beach is, don't you love it out here? I love it when the wind blows in your hair. She's very experiential. She wants to do stuff just to do it. I want to be at home because I don't want to do it. And so... But she's very experiential. And so she comes around when she's riding her bike. And she comes around the trees and she's like this. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on? And so she gets done. She's like, oh my gosh, that was so much fun. I want to do it again. I want to do that again. You want to do that with me? No. But I was like, I she was like, that was fun. I had so much fun doing that. What'd you think? What'd you think? And I was like, what I think. It was a race. <laughs> what were you doing? It was a race. You, you were doing so well. And Galatians said you were running the race so well. What held you back from following the truth, from staying focused? You, were, you did so good and you came around here on the bike. You look, look, look like Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> Come on, man. It was a race. And so I think, man, honestly, like Paul's painting this picture of it's a race for us. It's like, look, it's, we're completely dependent on Jesus, yes. It's not how fast we can run. It's that we're just completely focused on Christ. Completely fo Because what happened is she started getting tied up, and look how pretty it is over here. I like it here. Wow, these are pretty trees. Look at that bird, right? And so all of those things were a distraction from the point. And the things in our world, the things in our life, they're a complete big old mess of distraction from the point that, only, that Paul knows. What's the point? Jesus. Living my life to that moment to die is the gain as long as I'm here. Jesus. And when I, it's for Jesus. And when I, when I die, it's with Jesus. Right? And so we got to leave him behind. Look at looking back. Looking back implies our, implies our heart and our desires and our loves are still back at the starting line and not in the kingdom of God. That's what looking back means. That's what looking back, we're so tied up in some other things, even if it's good things. Paul was talking about, I had a great family, I had a great upbringing, I knew the word, I knew the law, I obeyed it. He was talking about good things, but he said they're worthless. They don't, they don't count for anything. The only thing that matters and counts is my relationship with Jesus. And so, so we got to leave it behind. Our sin, our pride, our guilt, shame, hurt, selfishness, desi selfish desires, our comfort, our security, our reputation, our anger, our grudges, complaints, excuses, jealousy, Laziness, indifference, preferences, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, whatever it is, it's garbage. Leave it, leave it behind. It's a distraction from what God, from, 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 from your race with Jesus. And so God's calling us from death to life. We talked about I ran out of the grave, and so we're going to finish with just a couple of scriptures. Philippians 3:15. 
he continues on. He says, let those of you who are mature think the way, think this way. So he's basically, Paul's saying, look, watch me, watch me live my life. Watch what I'm doing. Imitate me. All right. And then you should, if you're mature, you should be thinking this way. And if in, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it to you, which means you're wrong, right? I mean, look, you should be thinking what I'm thinking. And if you're not thinking what I'm thinking, you're wrong, all right? So God will reveal that to you. Only let us hold true to what we've attained. And Philippians 3 continues in 17. He says, brothers, again, brothers, just join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who have lived according to the example you've had in us. For many of whom I often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And their glory, they glory in their shame with mindsets, with their mindset on earthly things. So that last 19, he says, look, they're, they're end, there are people that are walking. He's talking about people that maybe call themselves Christians. There are people that are walking as enemies of the cross. Because, and their end, if that's the case, regardless of what you call yourself, it's, the, the, your end is destruction. Why? Because of these three things. Your God is your belly, which means your appetite is your desires. Your God isn't Jesus. Our, you know, and I'm not talking to anybody specific, but you're, he's talking about these people. Your God's not Jesus. Your God's not God. Your, your God is whatever you desire. You, li you live for what you feel like right now. You live for your own appetite, your own desires. That's become your God. And their God is their belly, their appetite. They glory in their shame, which means they're more concerned about others' desires than, than the needs of others. They, they take glory in things we should be ashamed of. Man, our whole culture is glorifying things that God would say you should be ashamed of. And so we latch on to those things sometimes, right? And so they take glory in things they should be ashamed of, and then their minds are set on earthly things. Rather than Paul saying, my mind is completely set on Jesus, he's saying, you want to walk as an enemy across? Set your minds on earthly things. Their only thought is what they can get out of this life and other people. And, and, and then he goes on and says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, our minds should be set on, we're, 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 we're just, this is, if, we're, if, we're, if our, we're a Christian, this is just a temporary home. It would be insane to build a home on a piece of land that I said I'm taking back from you in a month. And so, but we built, we, we, we set roots in this place rather than understanding my citizenship is in heaven. That this isn't my home, right? It would be, it would be, it would be nuts to, to allow my heart to be connected to this earthly, temporary home rather than being connected to what something is eternal. It would be crazy to let my emotions be run over by what's going on in this temporary broken place rather than all of my emotions being directed towards Jesus. And so we can't put our mind on other things. So I'm going to finish with this. Three questions. Thank you again, Dylan. What have you done this past week that matters in the light of eternity? Ask yourself that question. What did you do today? What did you do this week? What did I do that matters in light of eternity? Did I wake up and live my life for this temporary situation? Or am I investing my life into eternity? What did I do this, what have I done this past week that will not be remembered, that will be regret? What have I done that's going to create reward? What have I done that's just going to create regret? And the third thing is, will you join me in imitating Paul? Man, would you join me and, and, and trying to live that life, it's like, look, the only thing that matters is Jesus. I'm not going to get sucked in emotionally or uh, mentally to all of these other things that are on this, that are going on in our culture, that are going on around me, that are going on in my, man, the only thing that matters is Jesus. I'm just going to stay focused and I'm going to run my race. I'm not going to get distracted. And that's the thing that Paul said, look, imitate me. Imitate, don't, not by being in prison. Imitate me because that's how I live my life. Everything's for Christ until the moment that I'm with Christ. And that's a good way for us to remember. Every moment we can ask, ask ourselves, am I doing something that's for Christ until I'm with Christ? Or am I just doing something that's for me or setting down roots in a place that is not even my home? Let's pray. God, thank you. For Paul's example.
thank you for the example of Onesiphorus. Thank you that there are men that have gone before us, and women um, that have gone before us, that have shown us what it means to live out this, this life, this uh, journey of faith, this journey with Jesus. God, help us to stay so focused on him, on Jesus. God, we just need your help. We just aren't capable of it without you. And so the more we look to you, the more we run to you. God, give us blinders to the things of this world. Help us to leave these other things in the past, all the things that we carry with us, God. All the things, the hurt and the, and the pain and, the, and the, 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 the preferences, all the things that we carry with us. Can we, can we, can we imitate Paul and just say, well, I'm going to leave them behind. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to run to Jesus. God, we thank you for creating the path through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Pray that we would all know Jesus this morning. Amen.